your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Did you, y'all get one of these when you walked in? You know, there should have been one of these on your seats, right? So last week when you walked in, I noticed everybody's reading this the whole time I was preaching. So it's okay. That's kind of what I'm preaching. So if y'all read that and don't listen to me, you're still going to kind of get it. So anyway, I'm just, uh, I'm just so thankful uh, that we can come into this place and we can experience God's presence and we can be with the Lord and, and he can speak to us. God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through songs and lyrics and through his spirit. It's just amazing that God, the source of the universe, the creator of all, that Dan, he speaks to me and he speaks to you and that he speaks to us. Amazing. It's just amazing. Galatians chapter five. I just walked in this place just feeling so full today and so thankful so thankful. Um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Focused on that last week. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, verse 24. And those who are Christ's, anybody here, you are Christ's. And those who are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Everybody say, in the Spirit. Amen. Father, we just, uh, we pause right now, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, just speak to our hearts. Lord, that we would be more like you. We're thankful, Father, that you do part the seas in our lives, Lord, when we're going through difficulties and we're going through journeys. God, we know, Father, that you're still with us and you won't let us drown, that you've been there for us the whole way and that you're sanctifying us and that you're making us more like you, that we would bear fruit that would be good. I just ask you, God, that over the next few moments that you would help me to to just say what you've placed on my heart and that your people would receive and that we would walk out of this place better for hearing the word and putting it into practice in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia and if you weren't here last week, I'll do just a real quick recap here on some of the things that we talked about last week because these things are very important that you get this. Paul's writing to the churches of Galatia, many churches, and he spotted a problem that people in these churches, they were trying to add things to their faith. Uh, the big thing of the day in that, in that time was circumcision and all of these ceremonial clean laws, cleanliness laws and all of this. They're saying, yes, you have to have faith and you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this, checking a lot of boxes uh, in order to be saved in order to have faith. And he spotted this problem, so he was speaking to this. In the first four chapters of Galatians, he's talking about this legalism. Uh, Anybody ever get caught up and you have to do all the things and checking all the boxes and you feel like that that's what you have to do and you get exhausted doing all the things and you forget that it's really, we're saved by faith, amen? And having faith. And so this is the same kind of 2,000 years ago as it is right now. We get caught up in checking all the boxes. And then chapter 5 is, is all about, he's saying that you're not made holy by your external behaviors. You can do all the things and not be any more holy. And so this is kind of what he was saying. I said last week, you don't, you don't serve to get saved. You, save because you, 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 you serve because you are saved. You can't earn your salvation. You you don't give to get saved. You can't buy your way into heaven. But an external thing that you would do because of the manifestation in your life, the fruit that you would bear, because you believe you would give. It's just less amens on that one. (laughs) Just lighten up. I'm not taking an offering at the end. But I'm telling you, if you're saved, you will give. If you're saved, you will serve. It's an outflow of what you believe because God gave his only begotten son. He gave. He gave his life willingly. And so Paul is confronting this legalism that has 
crept into their lives. And so Galatians 5, 16 says, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. They are in opposition to one another. If you back up and look at Galatians 5, 5, for we through the spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. How? By faith. It's by faith. Our salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit through the Spirit by faith. Amen? Now look at verse 25. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit a lot today. So if we live, by the, live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So we live by the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit. Verse 18 says, if you are led by the Spirit, so we're walking we're being led by the Spirit, so we're saved through the Spirit, we live by the Spirit, we are led by the Spirit, and we walk in the Spirit. That's a lot of walking in the Spirit, all right? Now, the problem is, and I can say this because this is the problem that I have, that we all have in walking in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit, is we like to fast forward. We like to skip some steps along the way. We love the microwave because it skips a lot of steps in cooking. We, we love the microwave. We, how many of you ever put something together and a manual came with what you're putting together? There's a few honest people here. And you're looking for the quick start guide. You're looking for the, the thing that they added to the manual so that, because they know you're not gonna read the manual you, you bought a piece of electronics last week. I'm trying to put something together. I had a little sound system and I was trying to, all I want to do is plug a mic in and turn that one mic up. That's all I want to do. And I've done this my whole life, y'all. But no, I had a sound system just like this and I'm, and I'm just trying to figure out how to turn one microphone up just a little bit. I couldn't figure it out. So I'm going to the manual. The manual's like this thick and the first thing it says is, we have simplified this piece of machinery for you it's so much better than the previous model. And I'm like thinking to myself, no, it's not. I'm looking for the quick start guy. I just want to turn one mic up. It's not easier. I don't care what they say. But I fall into this category. We want to skip steps. Anybody on Christmas Eve, dads, <laughs> you trying to put something together, you skip some steps. And you for, there was one that you didn't read about and you had to go back and undo some things. I'm the only one then, right? It's happened, it's happened. So what we like to do is we like to skip the manual, which would be the Word of God. And we go to the quick start guide with our verse of the day. Some of y'all just got it. There's some smart people in this room. You just put that story together and you say, ah, I know where he's going with this. You know I'm gonna say, you just need to read it 15 minutes a day. <laughs> Pastor, you just keep talking about it. Yeah, I'm waiting on some of y'all to do it. Now listen, we all, want, we all want the Cliff Note version. We all wanna speed this thing along. We all love the microwave approach to life. The, the problem is we try to put our lives together apart from the manual and only look at the verse of the day and expect the verse of the day to get us through. The problem is we don't understand the context of the verse of the day. We don't know who's talking. We don't know who he's talking to. We don't know even uh, what it, the promise is. We want to claim a promise with the verse of the day not knowing that that promise may not even be for you. The manual is important. Walking in the Spirit is a slow process. Walking in the Spirit is, is putting spiritual steps together without running to the next four or five steps before you take the first three. It's walking in the path of the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit. It's walking in in the spirit, walking with Jesus, becoming more like him. It's kind of like a song we just sang. You don't become more like him by skipping the steps of the process along the way. 
The way you become more like him is called, it's a big word, and we don't talk about it much. I think I've preached on it a couple times. It's called sanctification. Everybody say sanctification. It's a process. It's, it's becoming more like him by applying the principles of the manual to our lives so we can walk in the spirit. It's this diminishing of sin, becoming more and more holy, becoming more like him. It's, this happens by the power of the Holy Spirit one day at a time, one minute at a time, one hour at a time, realizing that he is leading us. He's leading us in a pace. He's leading us in a direction that he is always speaking to us and he does this through his word. He can even do this through other people. I can be praying about something the previous day and I can, talk to, uh, I can talk to Paul and I can talk to him about something and all of a sudden something that he says, it'll click with me with a, something that the word of God said to me that I was reading about yesterday and it's something Paul says that it's like, that clicks with me. It's like, that's the answer, Lord. You've, you've put these dots together and I'm not running ahead. I'm being led by your spirit. God can speak through people. He can speak through his word. He can speak to us in the stillness of the night, if we allow him to. The problem is, we don't allow these routines, these habits, these things to formulate in our life, and we try to skip ahead. Because there's this battle and a conflict that's going on. It's the works of the flesh. The flesh fights against the working of the spirit. It is contrary, as we just read. Now, I want you to make a note. I always like it when I see people taking notes and you're getting your pens out and your papers out right now. I want you to make a note of two chapters, Romans chapter seven and Romans chapter eight. It's a continual dialogue. Chapter seven goes with chapter eight. And I want you to just read those on your own time. I do not have time to teach that, but I want you to read chapter seven in Romans and chapter eight in Romans for your homework. Will you do that for me? Because tomorrow, 15 minutes is gonna come and you're gonna have something to read. This is the deep, can I just say this? Romans 7, Romans 8, the deeds of the flesh will destroy your life. It will destroy relationships in your life. Now we know that to be true. I say that and everybody says, amen. Everybody knows that. The deeds of the flesh will ruin, it will wreck your life versus the fruit of the spirit and the virtues growing in you, becoming more like God. And last week we talked about uh, love. We talked about agape love with expecting nothing in return, giving love, expecting no repayment. That's agape love. It is a choice, it is not a feeling. And falling out of love with your spouse, you've decided that you're not going to love them, agape love. I don't have time to re-preach that, but John 13 says, by, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You must be full of the spirit to love like this. You must allow the Spirit to be working in your life to, to give love to someone when you know that they're never going to repay that love. This is what we talked about last week. This week, we're going to focus on joy. Everybody say joy. Do you know what joy means? A lot of people mistake joy with happiness. Happiness is different. Happiness is the result of external circumstances, things that sometimes you have no control over. These, these things happen, something happens, and you get happy. It's connected. This light, but let me tell you something. The moment that you decide that that becomes your happiness is your joy, you're gonna be really disappointed and sad. Why? Because your external circumstances around you are ever-changing. The hogs could have lost yesterday. They could have, but if they had of, would you still be happy? Somebody said, yes, it's because they know what real joy is or they're a Sooner fan and they don't care if the Hogs win or not. The Sooners won yesterday too, right? I gotta keep, I gotta keep my Sooner fans happy over here. Happiness is a result of external circumstances. And, and if, you're, if everything in your life right now is going great, Hogs are winning, Sooners are winning. Everything in your life is going, wait, Cardinals are winning. Just live a little while because life is gonna throw you some curveballs. It's gonna put you in a position where everything is not going so great. That is called life. And happy means you are liking what is happening. 
If you're happy, what's happening is your circumstances are making you happy or your current state is making you happy. The problem is people chase happiness instead of chasing the Lord. We chase happiness. Well, in three weeks, I'll be going on vacation. Well, you know, if you come back on Friday from vacation, Friday, now you're sad. Because all you're thinking about is how much money you spent. Kyle, you know, last week. Kyle's here. He took his kids on a beautiful vacation. And I'm just so happy that he did that. But I asked him this morning, I said, are you feeling a little broker this week? And he said, I sure am. Is broker, is broker a word? It is in a word, but not in that context. You're a little, you got a, your, your wallet's a little lighter this week, right? But last week you were happy because you were enjoying what's going on. But if you have joy, you're still happy. Happiness is generated by external, sac, uh, in, in external circumstances. Let me tell you what joy is. Can, can we look at what joy says, what, what the Webster Dictionary, y'all remember dictionaries? This is what Webster says joy is. All the young people's laughing at me. Webster says, an emotional pleasure from present or expected good fortune. That's what Webster says joy is. But the problem is, Webster doesn't live a spirit-filled life. Brother Webster, he doesn't understand the fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't understand what real joy is. Real joy is a constant satisfaction. It is a contentment, a calm delight. How many of y'all, y'all need a calm delight in the midst of some storms? Oh, four or five of us do. If the rest of y'all would be honest, the second crowd would be a lot, they'll be a lot more honest than you. But a calm delight, a, a deep and abiding, everybody say abiding a deep and abiding inner rejoicing. That's what a spirit-filled life of joy is produced in you. It doesn't matter what's happening around you. You still have a calm delight, an inner satisfaction, even when all hell is breaking loose. You mean when I become saved, everything's not going to be perfect? <laughs> uh, no. No. But you can still have joy when things aren't perfect. And that's what we're talking about today. Joy, real joy, biblical joy, spirit-filled life joy, it's kind of like bacon. How many of y'all like bacon? I just like to hear bacon frying and I like to smell it. I love bacon. Do you have to put oil in the pan to fry some bacon? Why? It makes its own. It's inside. When the heat is turned up in your life, let me tell you something. If you've got inner joy, if you have biblical joy, if you have spirit-filled joy and you're walking in the spirit, when the heat is turned up in your life, it's just like bacon cooking. Whatever is in you is going to come out of you. You will say, well, my flight got delayed. Well, that doesn't really matter. I'm just happy to be here. Where, in the airport? No, I'm telling you, you can get frustrated with life or you can have real joy. It's like bacon, it's in you. <laughs> it just comes out of you when the heat starts turning up in your life. I used that illustration, I had two days of, of travel delays and, and had to spend two extra nights in other places that wasn't near as fun. And I watched, and, I, and here's what happened. Yes, it was frustrating. But I watched my friend Chris Beam, who's here today, I watched him and he just had inner joy that was still in him. He had a calm delight about him. Didn't matter. It didn't matter. We're still alive. We're still taken care of. The Lord is still on the throne. And what is in me is just coming out of me. You know why? Because I've got real joy. Chris says, Real joy, a calm delight. This joy gives you calm. And if you're being controlled by the Spirit, you have the ability and you have the capacity to still be joyful in the midst of times when everything's not going your way. Now, John chapter 15 is where we're kind of hanging out here today. And I want you to look at this and what he says in verse 11. These things I've spoken to you that my joy remain in you. My joy remain in you and that your joy may be full. I really thought you'd be excited about that. Listen, listen. 
my joy remains and that your joy will be full. God wants you to have a joy that remains. He wants his joy to be in you and that it would remain. Look, look, look at it in the Living Bible. I love the way the Living Bible talks about this. Same verse. I have told you this so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your cup of joy will overflow. He wants your cup to be overflowing with his joy that he gives. He wants it to remain. We need joy in life. We need this kind of joy to deal with the stresses that we got at work because of your crazy boss, the crazy coworkers, all the crazy things going on in your life. You need this kind of joy, not the external circumstances of happiness. Just, well, I like what's happening, so I'm gonna be happy. No, we need spirit-filled kind of joy to, deal, to really to deal with the stress and the anxiety, even the depressions in life. We need this. Now, let me say this. Our life, it is affected by external circumstances. That's just human. That's just, this is where we live. There was two nights that we were stuck. Our lives was affected. But here is the main thing we need to understand. Our life should not be governed by external circumstances. That's the difference of leading and living a spirit-filled life. Now, I'm gonna look at this, first, uh, uh, John 15, five through 11. We're gonna read through this. And I want you to look at the word abide, and I want you to look at, at what he's saying to us. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gathered them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. If, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, the Father, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you'll be my disciples. Verse nine, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken, that my joy remain in you, that your joy may be full. It is his will that your joy would, that your joy will be full, that your cup of joy will overflow. That's the Lord's will. So how do we get his joy? How do we, uh, somebody's paying attention and not reading the paper. Here's what I want you to do. Turn the paper over and I want you to take these notes right now. How do we get his joy? Verse 11 says, these things I've spoken to you. So what has he spoken? Let's back, let's back up and see what he spoke. Verse five, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and he who abides, just what the gentleman said in the back, he who abides in me will bear much fruit. So how do we get his joy? Number one, taking notes, here's point number one. How do we get his joy? We practice his presence. Now God's with us all the time, yes, but we don't always acknowledge that he's with us. You know how I know that? I saw you last week at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> I'm just teasing, but kind of not. <laughs> Practice his presence. This is how we get his joy. We learn how to walk, we learn how to walk in the spirit and we learn how to abide. We learn how to practice his presence. We learn how to worship. We learn how to participate with God. Abide is used seven times in this passage. And any time in a scripture or any time in, in when you're reading something written by the biblical authors, authors, this is a Hebrewism. When one word is spoken over and over and over, you should take note. You should, you should pay attention. It's this Hebrewism. Abide means a shared space or habitations or inhabit to make to inhabit or inhabitant. How many of you have ever heard the scripture, uh, uh, Psalms 22, it says, he, God inhabits the praises of his people. We love to quote that scripture. You heard that? God inhabits the praises of his people. What does inhabit mean? It means that God inhabits, he rests in, he dwells, he dwells within and he abides in our songs of praise. So did you know that when you sing to the Lord, when you're singing out to him, what we're doing is we are building a throne for him to come and sit on. 
He sits on our praises. When we start to worship him, when we start to practice his presence, he inhabits the praises of his people. And what happens is when we start to praise him, we're building a spot for him to sit right in the middle of our lives. It's so important, inhabit, dwell, abide. They're the same word. In the Greek, it's the same word. God inhabits your songs of praise. And when we praise God, he sits right down in the middle of your life. How many of you want God to sit right down in the middle of everything that you do? Oh God, I want you to sit right in the middle of what you're doing and what I'm doing. I want you to be right in the middle of it. The way that happens is you just start giving him some praise. You start practicing his presence. In your presence, we love this one. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. What are we talking about today? Joy, his joy, that your cup would be overflowing. The Holy Spirit was sent to indwell. The Comforter was sent to dwell in us, to abide within the believer. And the Spirit transforms us. So we're saved through the Spirit, we live by the Spirit, we're led by the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, and we're transformed by the, by the Spirit. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Now, he's with us all the time. He's constant. He's always there. But the problem is, we come to church once a week, but we hadn't talked to him all week. And we expect our cup of joy to be overflowing. And this is not walking in the Spirit. That means you just come to church to walk in the spirit one day of the week, but you're not taking the steps in between. This is a problem. You learn to talk to him all day long. Learn to practice his presence. There's some people, they have no joy because they're not abiding, abiding in him. You don't participate. You, you wait for the church to call seven days of prayer. Let me tell you what seven days of prayer is. It's just a jump start. Here's seven days of prayer. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And you don't have to wait for us to call it because we're calling you to seven days of prayer every single week. So if you only pray during seven days of prayer, you're not abiding. Practice and participate his presence. Let me show you how it works. Father, I just want to thank you for waking me up this morning. Lord, I just want to thank you as I put my feet on the floor today, as I'm about to make myself a glorious cup of coffee, I want to thank you, God, for that coffee. Thank you, Lord, that I'm breathing this morning. You got me up. I have the ability to walk in this place and to give you praise. I can glorify you right here in the middle of my living room. And as I'm glorifying you and as, as I'm practicing your presence, guess what, Lord? I feel you in my life. You're giving me joy right now. I don't know about y'all, but I am. I'm feeling a great deal of joy right now. Why? Because I'm gathered with God's people and we've already given him praise and we've already given him glory and I've just started acknowledging just a few simple gifts in my life like coffee. Oh Lord, I wanna thank you for your people. Your, the sheep came into the, into the place today. They're gathering in your house and as I look at the people today, as I look at the sheep, I'm just excited in my spirit because they all came to gather to glorify you, Lord. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for making us more like you. Thank you, Lord, that we are acknowledging your presence in our life. Thank you, Father, that you've done so many good things. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. You just did it for us, Lord. That's practicing his presence. How do I get joy? I'm almost done. Practice his presence. Number, uh, verse seven says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, my word. Number two, promote his principles. Promote his word. There's a lot of people, they know a little word. The verse of the day, but even the devil knows the word. In the wilderness, right before Jesus starts the ministry, He's being tempted. This is Matthew chapter four. Go back and look at it in your next 15 minutes a day. This is an easy place to start. Even the devil, he quoted uh, Psalms 91 and he misused the scripture. Here's what we need to do. We need to promote what God is saying. Promote his word. Put his principles and his practices in your life. Practice his presence and promote his principles. We live in a generation we want the privileges and the promises of God. But 
but we don't want to promote the practices and the principles of God. And you don't get the promises without the principles. We like to jump ahead. We want the privileges, but we don't want to be in His Word. He says, if my words abide in you. And as I'm wrapping up, I'm going to go really fast because there's the logos, the written word of God, and then there's the rhema word of God that God is speaking to you something fresh. He's speaking something something that you need, an answer to a, a, a prayer that you've been praying. And if you haven't heard a rhema word of God lately, it's not because he's not speaking it. He can speak to you. He spoke to me this morning. We wait for someone else to get a fresh word and we try to apply that to a life. We, we say, well, I'm gonna get a fresh word through the podcast. I'm gonna get a fresh word through this. I'm gonna get a fresh, fresh word through that. God is ready to give you a fresh word in his word. Because when you become too busy to practice his presence and give his word priority in your life and promote his principles, it's hard to have joy. His kind of joy. So how do we get his joy? Number one, we practice his presence. What was number two? Promote his principles. We got some people taking notes. And number three is probably my favorite, is protect his prescription. The word of God is the prescription in our life. And I've always had a hard time with verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. I've always had a problem with that because I don't know about you, but I can't keep 613 laws. I know you can because you're perfect. This is the early crowd. Y'all are, y'all are better than me. I know that. I'm looking at you. You, you. Look at this word keep. If you keep my commands, keep means to protect, to preserve, to put, to put an armed guard around it. Guard it, protect it. Put some guards around the word that he speaks to you. There's, there's somebody here, you're being distracted right now. You just got a text and you're already, you're already allowing the enemy to take this fresh word from you. You're thinking about what it is that you gotta do. You're thinking, about, the enemy is always trying to get you to steal from you. To, you gotta guard the word. When the word is coming to you, you must guard it. You must protect it. It's just like going to the doctor. You go to the doctor, then you go to, you pay the doctor, then you go to the drugstore because he gave you a prescription. And then it would be as if you went home and you, you, you went to the doctor, you got a prescription, you went to the drugstore, you bought all that stuff. And it'd be like you got the prescription and then you just threw it in the trash. John, I did that one time. The prescription comes in a little white paper bag and I got the instructions out to read how to take the medicine, but I threw the bag and everything away. I didn't mean to. Guard the word. It is the prescription to our life to tell you how it is that we should live. But this describes us. We're careless with the prescription. We have apps on our phone. We can look at 32 different versions. We can look at all the translations and we have the Bible readily available. You can go to any dentist in any doctor's office. It's sitting right there. You can go to a hotel. It's sitting right there. But yet we do not protect it. We don't open it. We don't take time to read it. Guard his word. Get a hold of his word. Don't let go of the word that's coming to you today. Let it fall on good soil, not rocky soil. Amen. So today when you walked in, in your chair, that's that little, that little paper there, that little half sheet. I want you to look at that right now. We're going to bless you. God bless you. We are going to look at this right now, and we're going to say, hey, this is what the Lord is trying to protect in our life. The word of the Lord has just come forth. There's, on there, I've got mine right here. It says, pray this week that God will show you places in your life where you've not completely surrendered live this week by creating a habit of studying and memorizing his word. And and this one, I love this. Identify, it's the last one. Identify something that can steal your time or your joy and make a plan to avoid that. This is what we're gonna do. Over the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna read one more scripture. It's Psalm 1611, and this is talking about walking in the spirit that produces joy. Mark's gonna come back. He's gonna, the team's gonna lead a little little song, and I'm just gonna ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you, but this is gonna tie all together. This is the last scripture. Listen to this. You will show me the path of life. Sounds like walking. You will show me the path of life and how to walk. You'll show me that. 
in your presence, you're gonna, he's gonna show you how to walk. And in your presence is fullness of joy. As we learn to walk, don't skip ahead. As we learn to walk, not run. As we learn to walk on the path of life in your presence, full of his joy. We practice his presence, promote his principles, and protect his prescription.